Well, uh, we are in uh, John chapter 9 this morning, and I, I've been looking forward to this one uh, for a while myself. Uh, how to put it? I'd say theologically, probably John chapter 11 is probably my favorite chapter in the book, but in terms of uh, writing and story and just sort of John's wit and personality coming through, chapter 9 is probably my favorite. And so looking forward to walking through this uh, together this morning. Uh, but I was thinking uh, this week, uh, of course, on the, the miracle that Jesus performs. And it struck me that, you know, our problem in life is usually not um, whether we have poor eyesight or good eyesight. Uh, it's usually when we think we have good eyesight, but we don't actually, uh, right? <laughs> so... I was, I was thinking, actually, I was, I was hearkening back to, uh, what, it'll be 22 years ago this summer. Uh, Tabitha and I were on our honeymoon. Uh, we went to Kimberley, and uh, we're hiking around up there, and lots of, lots of nice hiking trails, uh, you know, when there's not snow on the ground there, so it was, it was a fun spot to stop. Um, so we took this one because there was, uh, Tabitha wanted to do some painting, so we didn't have a ton of water along with us, but, uh, you know, I had a little thermos or whatever, and, and she said right at the outset, is like, don't drink at all, because she knows I'm like a camel on a, on a hiking trip. Uh, she said, save like half of it, uh, because, you know, when we get, get to this lake that we're going to, I'll, you know, I want to do some painting or whatever, so I'll need a little bit of water to, to work at that, and I, you know grumbled a bit and said some, probably said something about, we're going to a lake, there'll be water there, uh, sort of, <laughs> you know, snide comments. Um, but it was, it's up in the mountains, right? So it's, it was a pretty rugged trail we're going over. And for some reason, like, I think we anticipated it being a lot shorter. So, like, I'm not wearing ideal footwear for this. And Tabitha's wearing, like, some some like sandals we had just picked up at an antique store so that yeah they they were wearing really well um on this hike but we're going and going it gets to be a fairly warm day down there in southern bc and you know i'm i'm like okay i you know we're almost there i i, I can i can hold out on the water situation or whatever but it was getting warm and so the 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 trail kind of yeah we went across a rock slide but then right at the end you kind of come over the lip of a ridge and then it comes down into this lake valley um, and so we get to the top of the ridge and it's all coniferous trees sort of blocking the view but every once in a while through the um, through the trees you can kind of catch a glimpse of the water and it's like a I don't know, like one of my favorite things about BC lakes is like emerald green right like just gorgeous um, and uh, okay this is this is gonna be a nice spot you know we'll get down beside the lake and just kind of cool off and Tabitha can paint or whatever and and it'll all it'll all be worth it so we're hiking down hiking down and and um, we're getting closer to the water you start getting more views through the trees or whatever and it's it's this beautiful green but after a while I start I start having some misgivings um, Something isn't quite right, uh, you know, but we're still just kind of snatching glimpses or whatever. So we get down to the lake shore. The emerald green lake water is actually emerald green grass. The lake is almost entirely dried up except for like a mud puddle uh, sort of on the opposite end of the lake. <laughs> so Tabitha and I just kind of sit there for a few minutes and then, and then I kind of look at her and I was like, do you want to just go back? Like, and we're just like dog tired at this point. She's like, "Yeah, let's just let's just catch our breath here for a few minutes, and then we're, we're just going to turn around." That was, so that was our really romantic hike was, uh, you know, dehydration and the whole bit. But I thought, yeah, afterwards it was like if we had seen it right away that that was grass and not water, like we could have turned around right at the top of that ridge, but we hiked all the way down, and so then we had this, you know, hike hike just to get out of the valley or whatever, right? Um, but the problem wasn't, you know, good eyesight or bad eyesight. It was just thinking we knew what we were looking at when we really didn't. Um, and so that's, that's kind of Jesus' uh, whole thing here. And, of course, it, it comes up many places in, in uh, the Gospels of Jesus dealing with the Pharisees. And the problem isn't that, you know, whether or not they have a, an accurate handle on everything, but the biggest problem is that they think they've got it all figured out. And Jesus, you know, 
will compare them to blind guides eventually by the end of the chapter. But but it's a really great chapter, and we're just going to kind of walk through the whole thing uh, this morning. It is a longer chapter, so you're going to have to bear with John, but I think he, he does an excellent job of telling the story. So we're just going to kind of plod through it here and, and yeah, sort of a, just observe, I guess, you know, the, the irony that John has at play, of course, is that, you know, the, we're going to get to see the, the sight of the blind man, but we're also going to get to see the blindness of the sighted, uh, of, of those that think they know what they're looking at. So John chapter 9, verse 1 begins this way. As he, that is Jesus, went along, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? That, that was kind of like a pretty standard question in Judaism at the time. If something bad happened to you. It had to be somebody's fault. And Jesus responds and kind of turns this on his head. He says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And so John really beautifully, you know, wraps this in, of course, with our previous chapter, uh, where Jesus has made this same statement, I am the light of the world. Uh, But he does it in such a way to point out this, like, sometimes bad things just happen, not because of anybody's particular fault, but so that God can be glorified in it. And Paul will, of course, echo this um, for us in, in his writings to the Corinthian church, right? Uh, that he has been giving a thorn in the flesh so that he can figure out that God's grace is sufficient for him. And sometimes that's, that's a pretty um, important thing to realize in, in the hardships we face in life, right? Um, that we're not just suffering through it because God likes making us suffer, but it's so that we can turn to him and see his glory. Well, after saying this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Now his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? And some claimed that he was, and others said, No, he only looks like him, but he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. And he replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. So it's an interesting response that this man uh, makes, um, to being healed. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, already his friends and neighbors are t- kind of, I think, seems like they're pushing him for some like theological answer, right? How was this, how, how did this happen? Uh, well, first they wanna, you know, they're not even sure it's the same guy, um, but he affirms, yes it is. Um, I am the man. And then they say, how then were your eyes opened? And, th- and that's, a, that's interesting to me, I think that's a, a very human response to God doing something miraculous in the world, isn't it? We want to know, how did you do it? Um, th- I, I was thinking this week of uh, Genesis 1 and 2. And, and we often come with that question of, God, how did you do all that? You know, creation in, in seven days is the story. How, how did that come a- around? And, and, of course, you know, scientifically, you know, how many... Millions of man hours have been spent trying to describe the origins of the universe, or rather the mechanics of the origins of the universe. And we come to Genesis usually with the same question, God, how did you do that? We kind of maybe miss the thing that God is trying to convey, and that is why did you do that? And I I think that's probably the same here in John chapter 9, where we... The Pharisees will get quite hung up on how did this happen, and we're, we're kind of missing the why. God, why are you working through this man, Jesus? And I love that description uh, that um, the man born blind gives. The man they call Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. So we're really, I think part of the, 
um, what draws me into this chapter is we get to see such a progression with this guy. Uh, and he really starts out at ground zero, right? The man they call Jesus. Uh, he's not even a rabbi. Like, he's not, this guy is just the man they call Jesus. Um, for a while, I got to work with a, a lovely uh, lady at my first church who uh, ministered to, largely to international students. She, she kind of just found this niche with um, Chinese engineers that would come over uh, to, to um, the U of A to get an upgrade to their, well, not an upgrade so much as a, a North American certification so that they could do work in North America. And so she just had a wonderful way of, you know, being hospitable, inviting families into her home, and then uh, inviting them to explore the Bible. But one of the first things she discovered was, like, you can't, you can't start in the Gospels with these people. Like, that, that makes no sense. Um, they really, you know, it was like, if they had heard the name Jesus before, which was questionable, usually it wasn't in a good context, but most of them were even... They had no idea. They were starting at ground zero. The, and, and so, you know, for her to start talking about Jesus, it was kind of like, yeah, the man called Je- they called Jesus. Um, and that kind of opened my eyes, too, just to realize I think that's truer in our wider culture than we realize as well. For a lot of people, you know, they've, they've maybe heard the name of this man named Jesus, but they don't have a lot, they don't have a lot of theological no- knowledge to put, po- pour into that container, right? And so, so like this man born blind, I, I, I kind of like this chapter just to kind of step into, okay, let's, what's the progress of faith here? What's the, the progress of knowledge for this guy? What's, what's his journey? Because uh, it is very much a journey, even though it's, you know, the story really takes place over the course of a few hours. But let's, let's carry on with this story here in verse 13. This It says, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. And we already know from John's gospel up to this point, that's that's kind of a big deal. The Pharisees are not going to be happy about that. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his uh, sight. Again, the interest in mechanics. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. So he's done something, again, you know, as a reminder, Jesus has done something that is obviously to their mind work. He has both healed somebody and he's made mud, which, you know, to us may sound like, you know, a kid making mud pies in the sandbox, not a big deal. To them, it's like, well, no, mud is a building material that you would build a house out of. So Jesus is has done the work of a doctor. He's also done the work of a home builder on the Sabbath. Uh, he's, he's doubly broken the rules, and they're not happy. So others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? And so they were divided. So on the one hand, the, Jesus obviously, you know, flagrantly breaking the law. But on the other hand, he's doing these wonderful miracles. And they, they have a hard time bringing those two ideas together. Verse 17, then they turned again to the blind man. What have, you to say, what have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man replied, well, he is a prophet. So, you know, contrary to what uh, Josh McDowell would have us believe, the, the guy's obviously got s- starting to maybe open his eyes spiritually a little to something that's going on now. He's not just the man they call Jesus. He's a prophet. So he's, he's recognizing that maybe there's something going on a little deeper than, than what well, what meets the eyes. Uh, verse 18, they still did not believe that he had been blind and had received a sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is he the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know that he is our son, the parents answered, and we know that he was born blind. So they can affirm the first two. But they start to get cagey. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said he is of age. Ask him. So of age, we recognize like that's any anybody at, who has had their... Um, well, it would be a bar mitzvah for, 
for uh, a male. Uh, so he'd be over the age of 12. Bar mitzvah just means son of the law. So it means you're responsible for yourself. We think this guy's probably a bit older than that. Um, if he's out begging, there's an expectation that he's somehow trying to um, earn his keep. If he was still, you know, 12 or 13, we, we think, oh, he'd probably still be living with his parents if he was born blind. But the parents really don't, they don't want to wade into the theological questions any more than anybody else does, right? Um, and there's this, you know, they get cagey, and there's this um, concern that they'll be kicked out of the synagogue, which is not just in their day, obviously that's the religious gathering, but that's a, a status thing as well, right? Like there's more going on there than just you don't get to come to church on Saturday. Um, that was a social construct to show status in the community. Um, if you think of, you know, even 100 or 200 years ago where it was like, even if you, you know, were the worst robber baron or the most cutthroat businessman in town, you might still come to church because that was sort of an upright thing that good citizens did, you know, and, and that was a way to, to build rapport in your community and, and foster good business connections. It was a similar sort of thing for the Jews. Um, if you were excommunicated from the synagogue, that hurt you in more ways than just religious gatherings. That would limit your ability to do business. That would limit your ability for your family to make friends or to maybe marry off children. And so they're, they're rightly concerned. And we'll see, of course, at the end of the, the chapter that, that they, were, they weren't just being anxious. This was a, a live threat for them. But verse 25 says, he replied, whether he is a sinner, so this is the man born blind, whether Jesus is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And I, and I think what a wonderful witness, right? And, and I think, you know, as much as we sometimes feel like we have to be really well prepared to answer everybody's questions when we share about what Christ has done for us, sometimes it's just the simplicity of saying, hey, this is, this is what happened to me. This is where I was, and this is where I am now, and I, and I thank Jesus for it. And it's as simple as uh, one sentence for this man. I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already, and you did not listen. What do you want to, why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? <laughs> this, this, now, now we realize this guy is... Uh, you know, he's, he's a bit of a wit. Uh, and then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciples. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we do not even know where he comes from. And of course, this has been an abiding theme over the last couple chapters is Jesus proclaiming that he has come from the Father and that he's describing the Father to them. He's, ca he's carrying a message from the Father to the Jews. And yet they persist in saying, well, we don't, we don't know about this guy's origins. Um, so this guy is starting to catch on. I think the, the ironic thing to me as we get into this chapter is we'll see that the more that the Pharisees resist what this guy is saying, and he's not saying much, like they keep asking, how did he heal you? Which is probably a question more of like, by what power or in whose name? And he keeps coming back to saying, well, he just, he made some mud and he rubbed it on my eyes. Like he's not, it's not a satisfying answer uh, for the Pharisees, is it? Um, and so they keep probing and probing. But the more that they dig down, it seems like the more they seem to elicit faith from him actually, right? Uh, he starts out by just saying it's this man, Jesus. But every time they keep um, uh, probing him on it, well, now we're at the point where he's, you know, this guy is a teacher. He's not just a prophet. He's a rabbi and he's got, disciples? Do you want to become his disciples too? Kind of turning the tables on the Pharisees. And so the man born blind answers them, now that is remarkable that they don't know where he has come from. He says, you don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And so this is, again, um, not like some prophetic utterance, although the way John includes it kind of makes it sound that way. But, but really the man here is sort of like just um, speaking about very normal Jewish theology at this point. 
uh, that that very widely can, um, very very widely accepted. And the Pharisees are really their their popularity, their s- popular support, really arises out of having a theology that everyday people understand. Uh, that's what separates them maybe from the Pharisees and some of the other religious rulers is they are they are a uh, theological camp that is widely popular in Judaism. And so he's really just telling them what they already have been t- teaching people over the years. Um, that if you're a sinner, if you're a terrible person, then God's not going to work through you. But if you're a good person, then God must uh, work through you invariably. Uh, and so it's, it's, you know, as much as it sounds to us as like simplistic thinking, it's really quite clever the way John sets this up of somebody, you know, this man born blind who really seems to know very little, and yet he's able to turn the tables on the Pharisees. They're not happy about it. To this they reply, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. So he gets excommunicated from the synagogue. His parents are, are rightly concerned that this might be an outcome uh, for what's going to happen. And they, they try to t- t- flip the tables on him again of saying, you were steeped in sin at birth. If you were born blind, like there's got to be sin involved in your life at some point. And that's a very common, um, that's a very common, even modern um, belief. You know, if, if, especially around blindness. Uh, we have uh, friends from Pakistan. Uh, their child was uh, ha- having some sight issue. Um, and they believed it was a demon. And so the cure was to get the demon out of them somehow. So the best way seemed to be uh, to pour chili pepper in his eyes, uh, which, yeah, not, not fun. Per- left him permanently blind. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of the thinking is like, well, if there's an issue going on here, like there's something spirit, you know, it's not just a physical problem. And we tend to think of that in North America immediately. We don't make the connection between the physical and the spiritual. But in many places in the world, that's, that's not much of a leap. And it certainly isn't uh, in Jesus' day. So we kind of end the scene here. You know, we've had the Pharisees come in and interview the man himself. Then they call in the parents. And then we call the man back as well. And, and there's been this progression. You know, when they first talk to the man, it's, you know, it's this man, Jesus. And then when we talk to the parents, we get this phrase from him, well, well maybe he's a prophet. And now he's saying, uh, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So, so this man bar blind is now kind of at the point where he's been convinced, actually, I think this guy's from God. Like, he's not just a good teacher or a prophet. He is from God, which is really just one step below in, uh, one very small step below in Jewish thinking of saying he is God. He is the Messiah. So we're getting, we're getting actually really close to identifying Jesus correctly. So after this scene then, Jesus steps back into the picture. Verse 35, it says, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Which again is one of Jesus' favorite descriptions of himself as Messiah. Verse 36, who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. So we we sort of, we get to the climax of the chapter, really, uh, of this man recognizing this is not just some guy named Jesus. It's not a prophet. It's not even somebody from God, it is, he is the Messiah. And you, you, especially in Jewish parlance, you only worship God. And so the, the conviction that it, or the description saying he worshiped him, it's a very clear statement of saying this man understands that Jesus is God's Messiah. He is God, not just sent from God, not maybe something like an angel, he is God himself. I think I mentioned last week too of you know especially um, you'll if you get into a discussion with say a Mormon or maybe a JW they'll fight against that concept that that the New Testament claims that go- Jesus is God Himself and you get these two chapters John eight and John nine and it's quite clear from the narrative that that Jesus is claiming to be God here and 
and you have other places, uh, even in the Old Testament, where you know sometimes angel people wrongly fall down and worship angels, and they say, "Say no, 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 don't do that." You know, I'm not God, and yet here Jesus clearly accepts that. But we have three more verses from from Jesus and some of the Pharisees. Verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. So the real problem is not seeing or not seeing, it's claiming to see when you're actually blind, right? It's, it's what we think we know, but we actually don't. Jesus says, for judgment I've come into this world. And that word judgment should kind of strike us. John has been interweaving that through the last few chapters for us. And it, the Greek word is very similar to what we get in English, uh, in that we, we usually, when we talk about judgment, it's usually a negative thing, right? Especially in a um, sort of, in a legal way. We, when we start talking about judgment, we, we sort of get a hint of like, there's something, there's a bad consequence coming. There's a, a unfavorable ruling that we should expect. But there's also the shade that Jesus seems to be bringing out here of just saying, no, it's, it's about accuracy. It's about accuracy. I've come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. So he's leveling the playing field. He's revealing things actually to people. And so his judgment is, I think here, more about being accurate in his description of the world that we live in. And so we get back, I think, to you know, weaving in this theme of from la- the last chapter of knowing the truth and having the truth set you free. And that as we listen to Jesus' teaching, as we hear him, as we abide in him, we are abiding in the light of the world. And Jesus says, I, you know, I have much to do. I should flip back there to make sure I get it right. He says, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. It's by relying on him, by relying on the spiritual light that he gives that we understand our world correctly, that we understand ourselves. That's the big problem with the Pharisees, right? Is they they don't actually understand themselves that well. They think they see, but they're actually blind, and they need Jesus as the light of the world to reveal that to themselves. One of the hard things, I think, in the Gospels is to understand Jesus' problem with the Pharisees and yet read the Gospels understanding that we're probably closer to them than we like to think. You know, if we've been following Jesus for any length of time in our lives, we, we start to get on, I don't know about you, I start to get on this place of, yeah, I think I have a handle on the truth. Uh, and the truth does set us free, but sometimes our attitude toward knowing the truth gets us in trouble, right? We lose some of the humility that's obvious in this man born blind of just saying, you know, there's lots of stuff I don't know, but what I do know is I was blind and now I'm not. A verse from Proverbs chapter 26 warns us this way. Do you see a person wise in their own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for them. A pretty, pretty pithy saying, a, a pretty helpful reminder that we're always, I think, reliant on Jesus' judgment in our lives. That we, ne- we don't graduate from that of like, okay, I, I, I've learned enough from Jesus now that I can kind of put aside, you know, actively needing to listen to him all the time. I think I've got enough of the word stored up in me. We always need God's spirit in us to tell right from wrong, to be reminded of God's word when we need it, to use wisdom as, as it's appropriate. So we don't, we don't graduate from that at some point. I think of, um, we've been just read through uh, Joshua with the kids, 
at home in the evening. And I think of um, the people of Gibeon, you know, that come to the, the uh, Israelites and say, oh, we're from a far country, make a pact of peace with us. And, and the Israelites know, they've been told explicitly by God, don't make peace with anybody in the land. This is, this is your land. You need to expel these people so you can, you can take over and live there in the promised land. But critically, the, you know, the Israelites and Joshua look at these people and they've got the, you know, the worn out shoes and the stale bread, all of the signs of um, having traveled a long distance say, okay, well, these must be very foreign people. We'll make peace with them. And then, of course, two, three days later, the, the rumor gets back to them. It's like, no, no, these people live, you know, like a half hour from here, actually. And they just pulled the wool over your eyes. And the thing that becomes obvious in the story is that the leaders and Joshua all used their own wisdom in trying to assess the situation, but they never talked to God. They didn't pray about it. They didn't invite God in his wisdom to reveal the truth of the situation to them. And to me, it's a very telling incident of, for all of us, you know, whether we're new to faith or longtime followers of God, we need as much as we are expected to use our wisdom and sound judgment, at the end of the day, we do need to be reliant on God and his Holy Spirit. We come to him in prayer because we're acknowledging that dependence week in and week out. And so I, I, I love that statement, you know, that the man born blind makes. It's, you know, all I know is that I was blind and now I see. And sometimes we have to come back to that simplicity of just saying, there's, there's probably lots of things that I might even be right on. But, but at the end of the day, I, the thing that I know that this is the truest in my life is what Jesus has done for me. And that's the thing that I should be willing to share. Um, and interestingly, as much as um, of all places in the world at that time, that man born blind sharing what God has done in his life, you would think Jude Judea would be a place open to a story of faith, of what, of what God is doing in his life. But it turns out to be a really messy incident of uh, getting expelled from the synagogue, opposition from religious leaders. And I think that's, that's a warning for us too, is like, yeah, as much as our story with Jesus is usually pretty, pretty positive, right? Of, you know, God coming into our lives, healing us, giving us sight, revealing the truth to us, it's not always a positive response to that. And that's the thing that maybe sometimes we have to brace ourselves for is saying, I'm going to share this, and I can't control how people respond to it. And yet God has called me to do it all the same. So as we uh, continue to walk our walk of faith this week, I'd encourage you, you know, think about what, not just, you know, sort of, the theology I've built up in my mind over years through teaching, surely, you know, good teaching and reading and things like that, but what is the core fundamental thing that God has done in your life? That's the thing that I think is most true, that is, that is, is where God reveals his light to us in Jesus Christ, and it's that thing that we want to share with people. Let's take a moment and pray. Lord, we do come before you and acknowledge that we don't always get things right. And as much as um, we are grateful for how you have led and guided each one of us in this room, Lord, we, we acknowledge that there's still parts of our lives towards which we're blind. There are big spaces uh, in your being that we don't have the answers to, that, that we can't explain. Lord, and we pray that we'd be able to um, acknowledge that before you in humility, that, that our lives would give off a pleasing aroma in that way to the people around us that see, yes, we're genuinely trying to follow you and um, acknowledge you and your son as God in our lives, and yet, and yet we want to hold that with tenderness. We want to hold that in a way that invites people into the, that experience rather than pushing them away uh, by telling them, we've got all the answers, Lord. And so we just pray that you would um, work a humility in our whole congregation, Lord, as we uh, seek to both share what you've done and yet 
um, not try to set ourselves up as religious authorities or authorities on life in any way. Pray that you'd give us that spirit of humility that we see so immediately present in your son, Jesus. We thank you for this time this morning to look at your scripture, to appreciate the story that's being told and to see to see how you took a man who hardly even knew Jesus and turned him into a follower of you, follower of you Lord. We pray that you would walk with us each day in a similar way, that we would go to deeper depths in our walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen.